Hi there. Don't be afraid. Come step into the light. Step closer. Oh, it's just me, DK. And I would like to read you a freaking book. We're going to get right back on it with I Jedi by our boy, the number one main man, <laughs> Michael Stackpole. So let's get started with chapter nine of I Jedi. Within a week, the rest of the Jedi candidates had reached the academy, filling the great temple with the life and color and laughter I guess it had not known since the celebration following the Death Star's destruction. Still, that celebration had to be tinged with sadness at the loss of so many comrades, whereas we were looking forward to the future, and that made us much happier. Master Skywalker allowed each of us to approach our training on an individual basis. While there were group exercises and organized teaching sessions, we all had a fair amount of latitude in what we did. I missed the sense of camaraderie I'd established with other trainees at the Corsac Academy, but we all knew here that we were pioneers and vital to the future of the New Republic. That put a significant amount of pressure on us to succeed, and a harder, tougher training program could easily have ended up pitting us against each other, and some of that happened naturally anyway. Because I took to heart Luke's suggestion that he wanted each of us to be comfortable with ourselves and our efforts, I would get up at dawn and go for runs along trails within the rainforest. Being up that early, I got a chance to see what I dubbed Prisma Storms. When the moon traveled behind the gas giant and spent time in its shadow, the nights would get very cold. Water crystals would form in the upper atmosphere, and the moon came out from behind the gas giant. The sunlight would be shattered by millions of prisms. The light danced and sparked through the atmosphere, crackling along like very colored lightning. Varicolored. V-A-R-I-C-O-L-O-R-E-D. Varicolored. I don't know if that's a word, but uh, it makes sense to be a word. That's not a word I know. I mean, I assume it just means uh, many colored, multicolored. The first time I saw it, I thought a fleet had showed up in orbit and had started fighting with another fleet. I quickly saw it was nothing to worry about and learned to look forward to seeing it. I shared the news of it with the others, of course. Some of them dragged themselves out of warm bunks to watch the storm's brilliant display. They stood there looking skyward while I stretched out and prepared for my run. As I started off and turned to toss a quick wave to them, I noticed that one of them was more intent on watching me than the storm. Gantoris I think I knew that personality conflicts would be inevitable, but with our unity of purpose, I was hoping they would be trivial. A tall, broad-faced man, who wore his long black hair woven into a braid. Gantoris had been something of a head man in his community. His abilities in the force helped his people survive, and he had all the earmarks of being a leader. He carried himself as one and had a healthy ego. He was not used to being second to anyone in anything and I think he decided I did all the extra training I did to curry favor with Master Skywalker. In truth, I was doing the extra physical training because I was just stubborn. I had decided before I arrived here that I needed to get into shape to be able to do well. And if I didn't continue, I'd have to acknowledge that I'd been in error. Gantoris was not the only person present with a healthy ego, and mine wasn't inclined to take any shots by having me admit I was wrong. I did my best to ignore the hard glance Gantoris had shot me, and just try to enjoy the run. The rainforest and humidity made doing just that very difficult. Despite small herds of run yips coursing their way along these paths often enough to leave a crowd of hoofprints, the local vegetation seemed determined to reclaim the paths. If it wasn't knobby tree roots trying to trip me, the woody skeletal roots of nebula orchids clawed at my face. The orchids were eye-catching in another sense. I'd never seen flowers that had such swirls of color in them. Part of me wondered what other patterns someone like Oral, who could see in the ultraviolet range, would discover in their blossoms. The humidity dragged at me the most, and my clothes would become soaked with sweat within the first kilometer and a half. My run took me out and around past the Temple of the Blue Leaf Cluster. With such a name, you would expect it to be surrounded with the blue leaf shrubs that tended to encroach on most other clearings. But this was not true. 
The name came from the leaf patterns carved onto the surface and around the doors of the smaller temple. I'd not yet been inside, but Master Skywalker had mentioned it contained a blue crystal that pulsed with power. He said he had no clue as to its origin or purpose, leaving me a mystery to solve in my spare time, if we ever had any. The main hazard in running through the forest came from some of the creatures living there. Running into a swarm of piranha beetles would put an end to my career as a Jedi fairly quickly. The blue bugs could strip flesh off bone faster than Jawas took to dismantle an airspeeder. Fortunately, the beetles tended to move through the upper reaches of the forest, and most creatures cleared out of their path with a maximum of hooting, hollering, and other useful warning sounds. I don't know if I'd be uh, bothering to run if that was uh, a thing in there. Woolamanders, with their blue and gold fur, moved in packs through the forest and seemed to take great delight showering passing targets with leaves, sticks, fruit, and anything else that comes easily to paw, like the occasional tree tick. I learned not to like Woolamanders pretty early on and found myself cheering silently for the prowling stintorils, stalking through the trees like an army on a search-and-destroy mission. The rodents had enough teeth and powerful enough jaws to take healthy bites out of the bigger Woolamanders. While I didn't want a host of stintorils to move into the Great Temple, I was happy to see them flocking in the direction of any Woolamander pack that decided to harass me. The thing I enjoyed most about the runs was that it gave me something to do that was distinctly mine and for me. That sounds selfish, but Luke had begun to stress that each of us would find that we had talents in certain areas of the Force. Talents that no one else might share, in fact. Their discovery would be just a small part of our self-discovery and growth as a Jedi. The runs gave me something to bridge my past life with my new one, and they also provided me a chance to think about what I was learning and where I wanted to direct my efforts in the future. Running was good for me, no matter what Gantoris or anyone else thought of my efforts. Cam and I had come up with a plan for teaching some basic combat skills to the other recruits, and Master Skywalker approved our plans with a few slight modifications. We took the others through the standard procedures, walking them through drills at slow speeds, then working along faster and faster until the reflexes sharpened and responses to attacks came automatically. Into this whole mix, Luke injected the Force, asking us to feel our opponents through the Force and monitor what was happening to them. In the walkthroughs, I had a great deal of trouble doing what he asked. I remember squaring off with Tion, the slender, silver-haired woman who was more scholar and singer than she ever would be a warrior. Still, her enthusiasm for becoming a Jedi and her ready laugh made her a good student and a better comrade. She came at me, her hands held high as if she meant to batter me down with overhand blows. I sensed her approach and can feel subtle shifts in her balance as she came in, but what I had felt had little significance to me since it was very easy to turn into the direction of her attack and use her momentum to toss her over my hip, which was exactly what she and I knew would happen the second the exercise began. As Cam began to layer in lessons about fighting with a lightsaber, sensing my opponent became more important. My ability in that area began to grow, but I didn't trust it enough to abandon myself to it. Though we sparred with padded wooden practice swords, I treated each cut or slash as if it were from a true lightsaber. Very defensive, I relied upon the basics that Cam taught and found they stood me in good stead close to 90% of the time. And that other 10%, Gantoris inflicted some nasty bruises on me. Cam's instructions can't be faulted at all in this regard because he taught us well the three rings of defense. The outermost ring consisted of four guard positions, upper right, upper left, lower right, and lower left. The lightsaber's hilt would end up wide of the body, with the tip coming back toward the middle to pick up the grand sweeping blows that are very powerful, but also take longer to deliver. The middle ring also involved four guard positions, high, low, left, and right. Whereas in the outer ring, the blade tended to be held at a diagonal, in the middle ring, up and down were parallel to the ground at head and knee height, while left and right were perpendicular to it. The idea with the middle ring was to pick up quicker blows and stop them before they could intersect with the body. Luke also noted that the middle ring was effective against picking off blaster bolts. The inner ring involved parries instead of blocks, and was proof against lunging attacks. For this third line of defense, the lightsaber was kept in close, with the hilt covering the navel. By angling the blade's tip and picking up attacks on the lower third of the blade, attacks could be shunted aside, and a riposte to the opponent's chest or stomach became a very real possibility. The inner ring was the last line of defense, dangerous to be defending from, and dangerous to be attacking from. That afternoon saw me pitted against Gantoris in a basic sparring match. Because he was taller than me, he had something of a power and reach advantage. My only salvation would be quickness and the years I'd spent involved in rough-and-tumble battles as a Corsac officer. It also helped that, because of my Corsac experience, 
I knew I could beat someone as big as he was, whereas I doubted Gantoris had ever found himself in a real fight with someone like me. We bowed to each other as we entered the circle described by our panting and sweating comrades. I turned to my right and saluted Master Skywalker, then to my left and saluted Cam. Cam raised his right hand, then lowered it quickly and shouted, Begin! Expecting a charge, I took a step back. Cantoris's eyes blazed with triumph, as if this concession of a meter's worth of territory was somehow a great victory. He gave me a cold smile, then slowly began to pace forward, much like a stentoril stalking a tree stick. He kept his feet shoulder-width apart as he came in, and his knees bent, but I knew the attack wasn't going to be coming until he rose on the balls of his feet and set himself to strike. My sense that he was going to do just that came nanoseconds before I saw him gather himself for the attack. I almost lost the impression in the violence of his attack, but I began to react to the force sense before the attack came in. My blade rose up to the upper right guard while I slipped to the left. I picked up his attack and knocked it aside so quickly that I surprised myself. Because I had moved out of the line of his attack and was already drifting past his left flank, with a flip of my wrist I could have brought the wooden blade down across his stomach. But I didn't. Instead, trying to cling to the warning I'd been given, I danced past him and set myself for a new attack. Another one came hard and fast. Gantoris's blade came up, around and down, in a crowning blow that would have split me from skull to navel. I snapped my blade up into the high guard, bracing myself to pick up the blow, but it never landed. Proving himself far quicker than I had expected, Gantoris whipped the wooden practice sword around in his left hand and slapped it across my right shin. Despite the padding on the blade, the blow hurt a great deal. As pain jolted its way up my leg, I tried to remember some of the Jedi techniques for shunting aside pain that we'd been taught, but being in the middle of a fight wasn't the most conducive circumstance for meditative arts. As I reeled away, Gantoris slashed at me again, catching me across the back of my thighs, making me yelp aloud. My face burned with shame. Here I was, someone who was helping instruct the others in self-defense, and Gantoris was slashing at me with impunity. He had me hurt, and I was all turned around and vulnerable. My self-image imploded as I read the shock and horror and comical smiles on my friends' faces. In their minds, I was a victim and clown. And those two images succeeded in grinding the image I'd held of myself as Kieran Halcyon, Jedi hero, into tiny bits. Then I got the very clear impression that the next blow would land on my right ear, and do all it could to drive it into my brain. Without conscious thought, I dove forward on my belly, then scissored my legs and rolled over onto my back, my legs tangled themselves up with Gantoris's legs and twisted the larger man to the ground. I brought my own stick around and smacked him across the buttocks, then kicked his legs free of mine. I'm glad that the word buttocks is used in this Star Wars book. Very important. Gantoris got up, his eyes narrowed, while I was just sat on the ground and drew my knees up to my chin. I resisted the urge to rub my shin and forced myself to think past the pain about what had just happened. At that moment, when I had been the most vulnerable, when I had been beaten... I had known what he was going to do, and I had been able to react to it. What surprised me was that my access to the Force had come at a point when I had been forced to abandon the image I had been trying to present to others. Once I got past pretense, and had just been what I was, the Force flowed more freely. It was as if the role I had created for myself had inhibited the flow, whereas abandoning the role brought me closer to it. Perhaps it's not for me to sculpt the Force's flow to my purposes, but for me to be sculpted into that which more easily works with the Force. Gantoris pointed his practice sword at me. Let us go again. I tossed my wooden blade aside. I'm ready. Come on. Take up your blade, Kieran. I shook my head. Whenever you want, I'm here. Gantoris looked over at the Jedi Master. Tell him to defend himself, Master Skywalker. Luke's blue-eyed gaze flicked between Gantoris and me, and then back again. It appears he is content with his defensive posture, Gantoris. The taller man pulled his chin up. It's dishonorable for me to strike someone who is defenseless. Luke smiled. Then, if you will not strike, he has won. Won without striking a blow. That is a lesson for you to learn, Gantoris. Yes, Master. Luke gestured to my sword, and it floated back over to me. That, however, is not the lesson Kieran needs to learn. If you will, Kieran, defend yourself. I plucked the sword out of the air and stood. I started to smile and offer a challenge to Gantoris, but I realized that would just be helping rebuild the illusion that choked off my access to the Force. I set myself and offered Gantoris a quick salute. Whenever you want to start. He approached cautiously, but as I watched him, bits and pieces of my visual perspective shifted. 
I saw a second and third image of him arise, with each of them moving to the right or the left, with arms coming up or around, and only when his true form rose up to match it would I know where his attack was coming from. I realized the images I was seeing were a sense of his thought processes, a reflection of strategies weighed and rejected. When he made his choice, I had already seen it and could sidestep it with ease. Over the next ten minutes, we continued to spar. My reading of his intention was far from foolproof, and I had the bruises to prove it. I did notice a pattern. After four or five successful evasions, I would become confident and even cocky, which is when the sense would fail me, and I'd pay an agonizing price for my arrogance. But keeping myself calm and focused, by letting my senses project themselves beyond my mortal shell, I could feel Gantoris, as well as see and hear and smell him. In the end, I evaded him for a full minute, with only the breeze from his blade hitting me. His chest heaving and sweat staining his khaki robes, Gantoris leaned heavily forward on his sword. This dodging and evading works well against sticks, but it will not protect you against a lightsaber. Feeling similarly drained, I sat down on the grass. I don't expect to face many foes wielding lightsabers. Gantoris' eyes sharpened. But someday, that will happen. When it does, beware. Luke entered the circle and dropped to one knee between the two of us. When that day comes, your progress in the Force will mean you'll have other, better tools to use in defense. Remember, today you are in your infancy in the Force. The lessons learned here are but the beginning. And that is but the ending of Chapter 9 of I, Jedi. Yeah, that was a fun chapter. Uh, we got to go on a jog with, with Kieran, not Corin. Remember, he's undercover. We got to do a little training and uh, learn about Gantoris, who is, uh, I guess, Corin's rival. Oh, I'm sorry, Kieran. And yeah, things are starting to happen. He's starting to dip his toe into the force pool a little bit. So yeah, very exciting. All right, I will catch you in the next one. And thanks for listening, as always. May the Force be with you.